Ah, we're back again after a week layoff. Moving, um, moving layoff. Yeah, a moving layoff for you and for most other people who just thought Memorial Day weekend. Oh, so that's, true. that's right. You didn't have to give the clue away. <laughs> I didn't even know it was holiday weekend until uh, you know the movers asked me. You know, so whatever. It's no, there's no holidays, but I am back. As you can see, there's still boxes back here. It's still a nightmare and a mess, but uh. But I'm back, and, and you're back, and we've got a big name to talk about in Arch Manning. Um, <laughs> so, first of all, you've been through this 100 billion years like me. People say he's the most anticipated and covered recruit in history. I don't think he is. I really don't. And I think people forget about the, 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 the madness surrounding Tim Tebow and also the Jimmy Clausen stuff. Um, you know, did you have either of those guys? You never had either of those guys at your camp. They were right? really before, really before, because if you remember, we were doing freshmen, sophomores in the beginning, like the right. so to take the time. We would have been like Tyrod Taylor. That would have been like the first guy that would have been and Joe Joe Hayden. Um, yep. Those were the first two guys. So the, I think Clawson would have been a little older than those guys. I think Taj Boyd too was one of your first ones. Taj too, right? Boyd. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so Jimmy would have never gone to a camp, ever. Um, and and not, that, not that he's a jerk or anything. He was a good kid. I liked him. Um, I saw him in person a couple times. Um, but he just didn't need it. You know, had a billion offers. And, it, you know, somebody, I think, it, I don't know who it was, who called him the, the, um, the LeBron James of high school football. But, but even before then, Tebow, when I first started covering recruiting back in the day, his, his decision between Alabama and Florida – was so anticipated. He was such a big name. You know, he put up those crazy numbers at Nice. He went to Nike camps and, and you know, benched 40 times. And uh, it was just nuts. Wow. Yeah, he, he was putting up. Remember when Joe Hayden was putting up those crazy numbers? Right, right. right. And, and we all knew because we saw his dad. And his dad was just like the most muscle-bound human being on earth. And then yep. his little brother came through and, and yep. tried to, you know, beat those numbers. Um, they put up ridiculous numbers, but Tim Tebow put up crazy, crazy numbers for a quarterback and, uh, you know, stats wise and, and testing wise. So I remember Tebow, Terrell Pryor was a big one. So people love to just, you know, it's, what about it's clowny, clowny, clowny was a huge one because he went beyond signing day as well. Um, and, you know, that's the number one player in the country, just like, uh, you know, just like Pryor was um, Bryce Brown. If you remember that nightmare, yeah, the running back. <laughs> with so, Tennessee and then uh, yeah Kansas back to Kansas State and his brother um Arthur yeah, yeah Arthur Brown went to Miami and transferred back to Kansas State but um so you know people love you know it's it's recent bias people love to say this stuff I people are interested in Arch Manning uh but I will tell you this without a doubt there, there there's just as much interest back in the day on Jimmy Kloss and 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 Tim Tebow and Trell Pryor and those guys but Arch visited Georgia this weekend. So here's my intel that I've had on Arch for a, for a very long time. At the end of the college football season, he was ready to commit to Georgia. He was all set to go to Georgia. He loved Athens. He loved Kirby. He loved the offense. He loved the opportunity. And Caleb Williams jumped into the portal, and Kirby Smart and his staff flirted with Caleb, tried to get him to come for a visit. Now, that would change everything for Arch in some way. Because A, he was told he was going to be the only quarterback. B, he was told he could play as a true freshman, which is amazing because Gunnar Stockton is a, is a highly rated recruit. Brock Vandergriff's there and all that stuff. Um, so they had to mend fences a little bit with the Mannings. They've done it. He took a visit this weekend, loved it from what I hear. Uh, and I think they're the team to beat. Alabama next weekend, Texas the weekend after that. Here's what he wants, and I'll tell you, you know, I'll ask you where you think he should go. Obviously, he wants a college atmosphere where he could be as much of a normal human being as possible. He wants to win. He wants to get developed for the NFL. Where would you go? And now, is Ole Miss in the mix still, too, or uh, just because of the family thing? No. No. And he also wants to play right away. So take the Quinn okay. Ewers factor at Texas. But I'll tell you, the Ole Miss story is that Ole Miss was never in it because, and this is what I've heard, he, you know, Peyton is a Tennessee guy, right? Through, right. you know, bleeds orange. 
Lane Kiffin's the coach at Old Miss. Lane Kiffin left Tennessee in the middle of the night for the USC job. There was no way on earth that Peyton was going to stamp Old Miss. Now, if Arch wanted to go, he's Cooper's kid. Right. Eli and Archie went there. He wasn't going to get in the way, but he was never, never rubber stamping uh, Old Miss because of that uh, Lane Kiffin situation back at Tennessee. And they just always kind of ran fourth, fifth. That's what I heard. Interesting. Okay, so Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia. No, uh, Georgia, Alabama, Texas. Jo- I'm sorry, jo- Georgia, Alabama, Texas. Texas, obviously, Sarkeesian. So is there, their relationship there, right? I heard there's there's some relationship. Very good. Very good relationship. Yeah, and then the Quinn Ewer situation definitely puts a, a, a monkey wrench in that because uh, if he go well. I mean, first first question is, if he goes to Texas, do you have, like, or, or between the two of them already, is there some sort of, it, like, one of them is going to be leaving, right? So, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you could go to Texas after if Sarkeesian promised you were, yours is getting, you know, whatever boatload of money <laughs> he's getting there. And then obviously they'd have to do something similar to, for Arch. Are they looking to fo- foster a competition in which one person is going to probably leave because that other person is going to be the starter for at least two years, right? So that's the tricky part about Texas and the winning part. He loves Austin. You know, it's a great little city. Yeah, it's a great uh, city. Not too big, not too small. Um, but that's the issue right there. I mean, Quinn Ewers transferred from Ohio State already. He's had his, his, you know, bite at the the one-time transfer rule. They did everything on earth to convince him to come to te- Texas. Um, you know, now Hudson Card is still in the mix for the quarterback job there, but the assumption is Quinn Ewers is going to play this year, and he'll have one year left. And with that arm talent that he has, which is similar to Matt Stafford and some of the great arms that we've ever seen over the years, then he'd uh, – move on to the NFL, but Arch would have to sit his freshman year. And I don't think Arch wants to sit. So, so you nailed it on the head with Texas. He loves Sark. Now Sark, you know, you want, you think about NFL development, Texas doesn't send quarterbacks to the NFL, right? Well, Sark developed Tua, uh, or helped develop Tua. Sark helped certainly develop Mac Jones. Those are two first rounders. So the family's looking at Sark and they're saying, okay, you know what you're doing with quarterbacks. We like that. We like you. We got a good relationship. We like Austin. Um, you know, it's closer to home, Louisiana, than the others. But can you win? And what about the Ewers kid? So that's Texas. Now, give me Alabama and Georgia. Like, what do they present to you if you're Arch Manning that you like? Who Who are the OCs of uh, Georgia and, and uh, Alabama? So it's, it's Bill O'Brien. Um. So Bill O'Brien, obviously from the the days of yeah. you know Penn State, and it's Todd Monken at uh, Georgia, um, who has done a great job. Now Monken is considered more of a balanced offensive guy. Um, Bill O'Brien's a balanced offensive guy, but Alabama hasn't been balanced. You know they've been they've been throwing the ball pretty good lately. So it's Monken and. You know, and, and two defensive coaches in Kirby and Nick Saban, but it's Monken and uh, Bill O'Brien. And Monken's also been to the NFL now too, right? Because that's where he went after a Southern Miss. He was a, with the Browns, yeah. So he's got the NFL pedigree. So does Bill O'Brien, right? Because he was the head coach. I, if it was me, uh, you look. Uh, I look at um, Kirby Smart now and Nick Saban on the. I, I'm not saying they're on the same level of accomplishment wise. But as far as as a young prospect, probably I would look at that as pretty much a a, a wash, right? Um, uh, Nick Saban's the guru. Uh, um, Kirby Smart's his protege who has beaten him, which is rare, right? Yeah. Um, protege to be able to beat the the uh, the, the main guy. Um, I like Todd Munkin. Uh, I even though Bill O'Brien has the bigger you know, he was the head coach in the NFL, obviously. Todd Munkin, what he did in this, it, 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 um, when he was head coach at Southern Miss and the innovation he, he brought there, then going to the NFL and now being an offensive coordinator, I, I think he's somebody that 
did amazing things with the quarterback that they just had. And I think to myself, what can they do? What can they do? With, what can Georgia do with Arch Manning? They did. What was the quarterback? The um, he was unbelievable. Even though he oh, was that, Stetson, yeah, Stetson Bennett, the walk-on. Right, he was a walk-on. Right, walk-on. Correct. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, if you're talking quote unquote talent levels, you know what you would say. I'm not talking grit or anything like. So obviously, Stetson Stetson did things you know above and beyond. Um, you you'd have to say. If I was a parent, I'd say, "Wow, look what they did with Stetson." If if Arch gets in there at six foot five, whatever he's six foot four, uh, with all the skills that he has, um, the ability to throw, he actually moves pretty well. Uh, he's got a, you know more Cooper movement uh, than uh, than Peyton movement, and but with Peyton's throwing ability, the Eli Peyton throwing ability, um, I I would almost think you know if Georgia has everything else that Alabama has. Um, which I'm certain they probably do, or they're pretty close. Then I would say, hey, if they did that with this player, what can they do with with my son? Where I look at Alabama as, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a rock star offensive coordinator, which is Bill O'Brien, right? And Bill O'Brien, rock star, may be gone. Now all of them may be gone at some point. I mean, that's just how it is. But, um, but we're going to do things a certain way. I would think that Georgia might customize almost everything to what arch manning does and that's why as a as a parent i would think that would be if all things were equal and then obviously not things all things are equal but let's say they all were equal that's where i would lean yeah so bryce young's going to be gone after this year to the nfl uh jalen milroe who is from texas who had committed to texas and flipped to alabama is awesome as a backup now nobody's really seen him except for the spring game this year, but he's got a ton of talent, huge kid. They got Ty Simpson last year, who some people had as a five-star quarterback. So that's the Alabama depth chart situation there. And Georgia's got Bennett, who's going to be gone after this year. He's a redshirt senior. Carson Beck, Brock Vandegrift, Gunnar Stockton. So some unproven guys um, that haven't really seen a lot of time. And so, but Georgia doesn't produce quarterbacks in the NFL. And Todd Monken, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In the NFL, struggled a little bit with yeah, Tampa yeah. Bay because he had, you know, Jameis Winston. Uh, that didn't work out. Um, and Cleveland, you know, with, with Baker. Now, he didn't really develop until the one season, but he was only there for, I don't yeah. know. He wasn't there for a long time. But but his, his record at Southern Miss, 1-11 and to 3-9 and to 9-5, and five, you know, to a bowl game is impressive then he jumped to the nfl for tampa uh and didn't really have a ton of success with Jameis. then he went from tampa to cleveland didn't have a ton of success with baker now comes back to college and has great success with a walk-on quarterback as you said so there's so many factors here i mean winning i think you go number one alabama two georgia three texas you know that's clear but that's clear. one alabama two georgia even though georgia just beat him last year um, playing time opportunity <clears throat> looks like Georgia won to me, and then Alabama and Texas kind of tied. Both he likes Athens. I heard he didn't like Tuscaloosa that much, but I don't know if that's true. Um, I think city wise, his favorite is Austin. I think number two is Athens, and then Tuscaloosa is, is after that. Um, the only place I've never been is where? Tuscaloosa. So I, uh, yes, Tuscaloosa. Never? That's You've been everywhere. Weird. I've been everywhere. I've been to Birmingham 9 million times, and we yeah. never just kind of cruised over there. Wow. Uh, so, so I can't – that's the only thing I can't judge. I can only judge, obviously, <laughs> Austin. Austin's incredible, and Athens is – I've been I've been at Athens after a game, and it's, that's pretty incredible. It is. And, and Austin's – you know, Athens is a little college town, you right. know, whereas Austin's a little city. Right. Uh, Austin's kind of hipster, you know, yes. and, and – the young kids, I mean, he's, what, 18 years old. That's probably something he, he really likes. And you can do anything and get to anywhere you want in Austin. Um, and so I had heard Austin was his favorite college town, followed by Athens. Um, I had heard the best relationship was with Sark. I had heard yeah, the, I heard the concerns were certainly um, you know, winning. And, and, and not yours as much, 
I think if you got Ewers and Manning there, you've got a potential issue and problem because that's two huge names. I mean, you're talking about Quinn Ewers is one of the biggest names in NIL, you know, from this for, for NIL era, uh, number one overall player. And then you got Arch, number one overall player. And that never, ever works out well. I mean, you know, Georgia had <clears> – <throat> uh, who was the kid from the West Coast? Uh, <laughs> Eason, a quarterback, five-star. Then they had Fromm, five-star. Then they had Fields, five-star, right? So Eason left. Fromm stayed. Fields left. Um, you can't make three five-star quarterbacks happy. You can't make two five-star quarterbacks happy. It just doesn't happen. Um, and in Georgia does not have – I mean, they got Vandegrift, who was a five-star. He would leave, I think, if Arch committed to Georgia. Uh, Bryce Young's gone. And then you've got, you know, Ty Simpson and, and Mill Rowe back there. So it's intriguing to me. Uh, I think he's going to Georgia. That's my guess. I heard his visit went well. I expected it to go well. I mean, when do you hear about a visit sucking? It just doesn't, never sucks, right? Um, personally, I wouldn't want to recruit him. I wouldn't. And this is nothing against the kid. Explain just, that. Too much attention, man. I just, I would rather have a very talented kid with the last name Smith or Rodriguez or freaking anything but Manning. Anything. I don't want that headache if I'm Kirby Smarter, Nick Saban. Sark, okay. You need to make a splash. You need to make everybody happy. Texas stinks. They need to get better. But if I'm Saban and Kirby, I'm, it's not that I'm not recruiting them, but I, I like what Saban did. I mean, that Manning said they only wanted to be – they want to be the only quarterback in this class. And Saban acquiesced for a while, and he said, screw it. I'm going to take Eli Holstein. Now, the timing of that was all interesting because it was right after his spat with Jimbo Fisher, and Eli Holstein was committed to Texas A&M at one point. I don't think it was personal, but he just said, listen, I got I to gotta take a quarterback. Now, if you still want to come here, Arch – Come on board, but you're coming in with Eli Holstein. And you remember years ago, was it Brad Stewart? You remember that name at all? No. I don't know if that's the name, but Peyton Manning went into Tennessee with another five-star quarterback. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and that's why I ask you if you've ever heard of Brad Stewart, because, you know, he ended up transferring out. I think it was Brad Stewart. I don't know what his name was. Right, because T was much younger. He was like a freshman when Peyton was Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. So Peyton Manning, QB with him at Vols. What the hell was his name? Nah, it's not coming up. Anyways, they had another great quarterback, and, and it just didn't work out. So I, I just – listen, you're winning national championships at Georgia. You're winning national championships at Alabama. You bring in a big-name kid in NIL, it could rock the boat. I mean, Arch could get – this whole $8 million Tennessee kid thing is garbage, right? So, but Arch Manning could legit get $8 million. He could because of that name. Um, you know, his, his brothers, uh, I mean, his uncles are already signed with a multi-billion dollar marketing firm. Uh, they have multi-million dollar deals with like fanatics or, you know, collectible people. They've got the biggest agent in the world, like, Arch Manning could make $8 million. And then, you know, we know Saban doesn't really like NIL. Um, how do you manage your roster if you got an Arch Manning coming in there making a ton of money and everybody else isn't making as much? What What is um, – so I know Cooper – and the reason why I ask this question is because I, that's the only thing that make me think that Texas could be a, maybe a possible option even – through all this is Cooper's was, is in the oil business, right? Is, is that, is that correct? Or some form of that? Is yeah. That he's, he's an American entrepreneur, uh, AJ capital partners. Um, I don't, of, I don't know if it's oil. Um, but he does a lot of business at tech. Or I heard, I heard he does a lot. Of, there's a lot in the, well, Louisiana, Texas, Louisiana, Texas, Louisiana is like little Texas. So it, it's, they're, they're tied in a lot of ways with oil, similar kind of, industries uh especially down that southern area yeah of, of louisiana and texas the energy energy company, company. private energy companies equity firms so energy energy's oil so yes yes 
Right. So it, it, that's the only thing that makes me think that I don't know is is there a long term play for him with all those other relationships too? Right? Are are these guys? I don't. I, the Mannings don't need money per se, right? But um, is there a capacity that from all those relationships that they want to fork over significantly more NIL than the others, or does it really? But does it really matter? Because probably everyone will just match whatever you get. I guess, right? Like if I'm if Texas is going to give me five mil, why wouldn't I get five mil from Georgia or Alabama? What does it matter, right? Yeah, yeah, you will. And and you know, obviously, everybody's like, okay, Peyton's rich, Eli's rich. Well, Cooper's rich, right? And he, he's rich, rich. You know, um, money is is not a thing here. And and one of the things that was interesting. Early in this process, I had a few schools contact me and they say, okay, who's the tightest kid on the team to arch? Because that's the angle they wanted to play, you know, get that kid. And and I forget the kid's name. It's a wide receiver on the team there. Um, and I said, well, no luck there because A, the kid isn't that level, but B, that kid's rich too. I mean, <laughs> the, 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 he's just his father's loaded – you know, this is this is is it or Newman yep. school in, in New Orleans is there, it's no joke. And so money is not going to play in here. He's going to make money. He could right. have already signed. Honestly, I mean, he could have already signed deals and I don't know about it. But right. money is never, ever, ever going to be an issue with the family. But it could be an issue with other players. So here's another example. You get to Texas, right? Let's say he picks Texas. Quinn Ewers transfers from Ohio State. He's promised this, that, and the other. Let's say Quinn Ewers make it $2 million, right? Arch comes in and makes eight. <coughs> well, these kids have egos, you know? They, they, it's going to be uncharted territory as to, like you had mentioned last time we talked, how you guys were scraping for money together to get a 12-pack on a weekend, right? Now... If you got a kid who's making that much money on your team, and let's say he's he's kind of there's jealousy involved or he's ostracized, or let's say he's not playing up to his capabilities, you got a problem. And I don't think Saban and Smart want that problem. Now, I think Kirby Smart would take it over Nick Saban. I think Nick Saban's hosting Manning this weekend, and he's gonna say to him and the family, listen, you want to come here? You'll be a first rounder, you'll win national championships because that's what we do. That's what our quarterbacks do. Um, if you don't, then that's great. But I'm not going to, you know, promise anything. I'm not going to give you this, that, the other. I think his approach is going to be completely different than Smart's approach this weekend and Sark's approach in two weekends. Do you think that Sark and um, Smart's approach is still almost from a we need you standpoint? And Saban is like, hey, we'd love to have you, but if yeah. you don't want to come here, you know, if you want to win championships, you'll come here. If you don't come here, we're going to win championships. So it, it, it's really your choice. You it may know? work. It may work. But, yeah, that's the approach I really do believe. Because, you know, the Georgia quarterback situation isn't set in stone. And we don't know if Quinn Ewers is going to be good. We know he's got a magic arm. There's no doubt about his arm. Strength, yep. talent, off-platform, everything he can do is ridiculous. But we also saw that in, I don't know if you remember, Anthony Morelli. hundred oh, yeah, years. Of course, yeah. Yep. Gorgeous, right? It's seven on seven, looked like a god, you know? And then a pass rush came in college, and he just wasn't good, you know? We don't know if Quinn's going to be that guy. You know, who, you know, makes bad decisions when the pass rush comes, when he's in live football action, blah, blah, blah. So it's less determined that there's success at Texas there. Um, but Alabama, yeah, I think Nick Saban's looking at his quarterback room. He's going, okay, I got a Heisman winner, and he's probably going to win the Heisman again this year. I got Mel Rowe, who's probably going to win the Heisman, you know, maybe next year. <clears throat> I got Ty Simpson. I got Eli Holstein. I'm good. If you want to come here, hey, that's great. And I'll make it my problem to deal with. But if you don't, now I had this stupid theory, which was, I don't know. Nick Saban was very, very friendly to Kirby after he lost the national championship. And it was weird to me, you know, like Nick Saban's not that guy. 
you know, and everybody said, oh, this is the kinder, softer Nick Saban. And, you know, he was congratulatory of his protege, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but then the whole Jimbo thing came around and I saw the old fire of Nick Saban and how pissed off he is that he lost to AM last year, that he didn't win the national championship again. And I think they're going to win it this year. My thought was <clears throat> that stick it to Kirby for beating you and tell the Mannings, listen, if you don't come to Alabama, Texas is the place to go. But people kind of threw a, a, a monkey wrench in that saying that, you know, they're going to be in the SEC in, in 2025, I believe. Right. But still, he's a 2023 kid. So he'll be a freshman 2023, 2024. He'll be in the Big 12 uh, for a couple of years. But that would be an evil genius move by Nick Saban to say, listen, we'd love you. If you're not going to come here, though, don't go to Georgia. Look at what they did with Justin Fields. You know, they got lucky with Stenson Bennett. You know, they, they, this, that, and the other. Go to Texas where Sark is, where I know him as an offensive genius. Head there, um, and he would screw over Georgia at the same time um, as not getting Arch Manning. It's a really interesting theory. And I think the part about where he said he got lucky with Stenson Bennett, meaning – I think you could partially pitch that and say Stenson Bennett was an underappreciated one of these, like, I mean, he's not the same level as Johnny Manziel, but Johnny Manziel type players where he just has magic and he's got that magic kind of thing going on for college. And if you gave, if you gave a guy like that the opportunity and put him in the right situation, he could have did it everywhere. He was just an underappreciated person for whatever reason that is. And you could point and say that that could have been not coaching and Stenson Bennett was just that kind of a guy. Or right? the defense completely carried that team. True. Yeah, you could just say that. Listen, that was say a that. One, once in a lifetime defense. They gave up like 54 points the whole freaking season. It was right. unbelievable. Never going to happen again. You know, um, they won the national championship. That offense didn't. They they had Brock Bowers as a true freshman tight end as their leading receiver. We took their best receiver in Jermaine Burton. Listen, Saban doesn't negative recruit because he doesn't have to. And this I kind of know because he just doesn't. I've heard of negative recruiting from everybody on earth except for Nick Saban. Everybody. Everybody. Zero exceptions except for him. <clears throat> but this would be kind of a funny, let's stick it to Georgia Send this kid to Texas. Now, the Mannings might not listen, but if Nick Saban's telling me something, I'm listening. So that was my theory. Because once he took Holstein, it's like almost why take this visit? If you want to be the only quarterback in this class, if you want to go someplace where you're going to play immediately and, and, and be the guy, why go to Alabama? You're not going to be the guy. I don't think he's better than Milrow. Um, and you've got another quarterback in this class who's a pretty talented kid. So why even take the visit? Um, so this, this visit this weekend is going to be extremely interesting. Whereas the Georgia visit was all, we love you. We need you come here. The Texas visit is going to be all, we love you. We need you come here. The Alabama visit could be very, very different. Is How did Quinn do in spring ball? He did well. I talked to a lot of people down there. They said the, the, the arm, the, the name John Elway was mentioned. Okay. And these are, this is by some, some offensive coaches, you and I have known for a very, very long time who just don't throw that around. Right. And so, you know, if it's not John Elway arm, it's Matt Stafford arm, but those are two of the elite arms you're ever going to see in football. They said, they told me if they can keep him upright and they had a great offensive line recruiting class, but they're young, he will put up monster numbers. He will mm -hmm. not be stopped, you know, and this was the pitch to Jordan Addison when he visited there too. It's like, listen, we got Xavier worthy. But if we got Xavier Worthy and you with B. John Robinson in the back, if if Quinn Ewers stays upright, you guys are all putting up crazy numbers and we're winning the national title. That was the pitch. So he's looked good. Now, that's according to my sources. On the Internet, on social media, Hudson Cards look great. And, and Quinn hasn't picked up the offense that well. Um, to me, it's done. Quinn Ewers is starting. But there's a lot of this Hudson card is really good type of talk. Um, so that's intriguing to me as well. Yeah, that's interesting. Because Quinn Ewers, is if Quinn Ewers is going to start and then puts up monster numbers, I mean, now you're sitting, I guess, what, two more years, right? So 
Uh, if you're you're saying, you're sitting, he'll be sitting one because Quinn put his year in at Ohio State. Yeah, oh, you put one in. That's right. So that's you gotta right. have your three, and then he yeah. gets, starts this year, and then starts next year. But the Mannings don't want him to sit. Period. Yeah. I've been told that they want him to be the starter from day one. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. It's a is he ready? <sighs> I, I mean, I know Car- Isidore Newman plays pretty low level competition other than some superstars they'll go against here and there, but I don't know if he's ready. Um, I don't know. I I think, you know, people ask me, is he, is he, is he overrated? I I don't, I'm not convinced he's the number one quarterback in this class. That's just me. Um, You know, it's a very, very talented 2023 class, and I won't get into who else could be better. Right, right. And I don't know if – listen, did I I think Trevor Lawrence was ready? Yeah. Do I think Arch Manning's ready? No. I don't don't see that. I don't see that same – I'm going to just be – I'm so good in high school. Now, maybe I'll see that this upcoming season. Uh, But with Trevor, I saw, you know, high school's not a challenge anymore. He's going to just take over college football early. That's a big difference. I, I just think that um, like even OBJ who played, I think a little bit right away, but you know, just coming from, you know, that, that prep school it, that really that high end prep school type environment where they don't play a ton of great competition all the time. Speed is a little bit of an adjustment at now. Great athletes adjust pretty quickly. Cause I, I remember the first time I went to college, carried the ball the first time a guy hit me pretty quickly. I was like, oh, I got to move much faster. And you kind of adjust. But for a quarterback that, you know, for a skill position player, that takes a couple of weeks. For a quarterback, that could take a couple of months, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe yep. maybe six months. So they do adjust if they're that, that kind of a guy. But, you know, coming from a prep school environment, do, do you have enough? And, I, you know, I, and I don't know enough whether he do, did a lot of, other things, I don't think he did a lot of the other stuff outside of like QB training and camps and stuff like that, right? He wasn't, um, no, he has all that at home. I mean, obviously, right? right. He doesn't need to go on a, the seven on seven tour or whatever. He's right. not even, he's, I saw the Elite 11 list and I don't, I don't delve into it as much, you know, because, you know, we used to cover every Elite 11 and this, that, right? He wasn't on the Elite 11 list. And and people started to ask me, what the heck? I, I don't think he went to an Elite 11 camp. That's my guess. I didn't really delve into it to see why, but I can't picture him going to any camps. Right. That, that's what I was thinking. Because so, I remember I remember with Jabri- in New Jersey, Jabril Peppers, when he was uh, at uh, Don Bosco and then Paramus Catholic, like he didn't go to any camp. Never went to a camp ever. Like he didn't have to go to a camp. From the second he stepped on the field, he was the best player in New Jersey and he was a freshman. I remember him running for a touchdown at Don Bosco in the state championship game and made it look like, he was 14 years old or 15 or whatever. He made it look like he was 20, you know, 25 year old pro. It was so easy for him. And so, we, uh, we tried to get him to camps. You did. I did. Everybody did. That yeah. was a whole, that was a whole thing. Um, yeah. So he doesn't need that. And I don't know how his development will be. Um, you know, again, he's got the last name. There's a lot to live up to and none of them failed. I mean, Cooper, they say, which is again, what people say, you know, he was the best athlete of all of them, which is great. He was a wide receiver. He's going to Ole Miss. He had spinal stenosis and had to, to you know, medically retire. Right. I don't know. You know, listen, we're talking our, you know, Archie Manning legend, and we're talking Peyton Manning legend, and we're talking Eli who beat Brady twice. So I don't know, you know, but the Manning pedigree is pretty good, and, and I think he's going to be successful. I'm just not sure if he's ready to take over a team – you know, immediately as a true freshman, but that's what they want. I mean, and why wouldn't they? Why would you go to a school and say, listen, yeah, I'm thinking about sitting a year or two. No, no, no. They want to play right away. So that is going to be the interesting visit this weekend to Alabama. I think UGA leads right now. Texas will have to finish this and close it out really strong. Here's the other thing. If he commits to Texas, let's say he commits to Texas in June and they get throttled by Alabama and Oklahoma in their first four games uh, or five games, he might decommit because Sark will be on the hot seat. If they lose to Bama by 30 and Oklahoma by 30, mm. which could happen, <clears throat> then he's on the hot seat. He, he was on the hot seat last year as a first year coach. So, but let's get to kids who don't get the attention that Arch Manning does. Sure. 
I do get tired of talking about Arch Manning, but then every time I want to get on a podcast, I, I feel like I have to talk about him because, you know, maybe he is the most touted recruit ever. I don't know. Did I do this with Jimmy Clausen? Jimmy Clausen, we knew where he was going to go. That was easy. We knew. Charlie Weiss turned down Mitch Mustaine. Mitch Mustaine wanted to decommit from Arkansas and go to Notre Dame <clears throat> in 2006, I think it was. And Charlie Weiss said, nope, I got Jimmy Clausen, period. And I'm saving that spot for him in 2007. So there was a lot less intrigue with him, whereas prior <clears throat> was the whole dad wants him to visit Penn State at the last second. He wanted to go to Ohio State. Rich Rodriguez was hired at Michigan that year, which would be perfect offense for Pryor. So he was thinking about Michigan, and that was a whole mess. And then Clowney, we all knew was going to go to South Carolina. Everybody knew it. Um, I did talk to his old coach, Bobby Carroll, recently, um, and he told me Alabama almost got Clowney. Almost. He was done to take South Carolina. It was done. There were so many political issues in state that he took the visit to Clemson uh, out of politeness, but he was never going to go there. Um, he was done, done. Like the, the name was embroidered on the Jersey and he visits Alabama and he came back and he's like, I love it there. I think I want to go there. And then all the powers that be in the state of South Carolina converged on him and, and he ended up going to South Carolina. So anyways, that's a side story about him. So exposure, you were talking about Juju Lewis, 2026 quarterback. I'm looking at his Twitter profile, and I'm seeing him smiling here with Nick Saban getting offered by the GOAT on June 4th. Yep. Um, a talented, talented kid, right? But the marketing that has been done and the early promotion that has been done, you know, by his family has been crucial, crucial in his name getting out there. And that's part of what we're offering. Now, we're not going to make you Juju Lewis. We're not going to get you right. a three-year early offer to Alabama. But if you don't think marketing is important and recruiting, this kid's a great example of why it is. Yes. I, I think no longer, you if you're a talented athlete, you have to also be able to leverage the side of getting your name out there. And that's what we've been able to offer you, you'll soon see some of the players that we've been doing this with, and you and you may already have been seeing it. Uh, they're they are starting to get all kinds of new exposure that they never had before. Between what me and Mike are doing, it's a unique thing. It really is a unique thing. Never before, I I, I say this and I stand on it. In the modern era of recruiting, have you had two people that have had a following over the last twenty years? Mike, obviously being the guru of of recruiting for the last twenty plus years, um, with with Rivals.com and and just his overall presence uh, from an, analyzing every five star there has been for the last twenty plus years, okay. And then my side on the the camp and recruiting side, and and coaching, and you're getting a coach that has been doing it in the recruiting side and the number one analyst arguably in the world um and our following that's the most important thing right not not just what we know but right. really, uh, our following is is our worth so the pe people trust what what we've been able to put out there over the years and when we're saying hey these players can do this this or this um we're giving you a fair perspective and we want to put everything that you're doing well in light right and um, and, and honestly, that's what uh, Juju Lewis has done a great job. His father's done a great job with that and, and the people around him. He's a very talented quarterback, and he's been able to put that out in front of people. He's gone to places where he's been able to, to, to get that kind of notice, and he's made those relationships. We're trying to fast track you. So that's the whole thing with this is that um, whatever ability you have to go to the next level, that highest Division One level, um, we're going to be able to try and fast track that for you, get your name out there. Mike, what do you think? Yeah. So I, I will tell you this too, is like the kids that we've done so far, some of them, I believe are, <clears throat> you know, FBS players for sure. And, and two of them, I believe are power five um, ability players. And, and after we did our promotion for them, and again, it's, it's over a million <clears throat> followers and, and in those followers, it's not just, you know, 
some, you know, booger eating guy in his basement down south, right? It's coaches, <laughs> you know, you're, you're going to get exposure to coaches. Like the, the guy who lives in his mom base, mom's basement isn't going to get you a scholarship. So we have those followers, but we've got coaches. I mean, <clears throat> the only coaches that don't follow us are not on social media, period. That's it. Right. And, and you bring the coaching perspective. I've never coached a day in my life ever. And I never will. Um, I'm not an X's nose guy. You know, I could break down film and do all that stuff, but I'm not a, a, a X's and O's game planning coach. Right. And I, I can't speak to what it takes <clears throat> to actually be on the sidelines and mentor kids in that manner. Uh, but I've scouted every good kid since 1998. Everyone. Um, I've missed on a lot. I've hit on a lot. But I also I know what to look for. Um, and I know instantly. FCS, FBS, Division Three, Power Five, instantly, and so we delve into the highlight films, but also into the game films and things like that, um, you know, and and the strengths and weaknesses. But the the kids we've talked to, they've gotten a lot more attention. Now that doesn't mean they're going to get scholarships. You yeah. know, we, we're not promising that. We're not calling schools on your behalf. But I will tell you this: no one's been unhappy, and everybody's come back to me and said, "Really appreciate the notor." notoriety because some people had no idea who, who this kid was, whether it's a quarterback in Nebraska or a, an offensive lineman in California. Um, and that's where the value lies as well. So I like it because, like I said, if I look at something, I could throw it to you and say, what do you think? Am I seeing the right thing here? You know, and you could do the same thing to me, but you've coached, you know, this is no offense to the kids, but you've coached good kids and horrible kids, horrible, right? So, you know, and, and at your camps, you've had future five stars and you've had future no stars. Like you've had seen so many people come through that I'm more on the spoiled side where I was focusing on the four and five star kids uh, and the younger kids with offers that sometimes I look at something and I'm overly critical of it. And I flip it to you and I say, am I seeing this right? Because I don't like what I see here. And you'll be like, well, you know what? I think you might be a little harsh in that area. Right. And that's a good balance for me. And, and I think for you, you might see a kid that, that maybe a scrapper or somebody, you might see yourself in them, you know, that went to UConn. And you can flip it to me and I can say, listen, Dave, I know he's a great kid. He, the effort's like crazy, but he's just he's not going to grow. He's not going to be big enough. He's not going to do this, that, and the other. And so it, it really is a good balance of coach and analyst. Um, and it's valuable. I mean, in this day and age, you can go out and pay if you want 1500 bucks to go to, you know, a three day camp, or you could pay $2,500 to somebody who promises you a scholarship. This is just flat out exposure and an honest opinion on how good you are. And I've been surprised because I've told, I've told parents this is his level and not one of them has come back to me and said, you, you suck. You're an idiot. And I'm so used to that with the four and five star kids from fans. And it just gives me a perspective that there are people out there who really do have a, a unbiased opinion on their own kids or their own players, as opposed to, Oh, I'm a Tennessee fan. How dare you not rank this kid a five star? He's going to Tennessee. Well, I think that's that's a true statement. I think ultimately they want to be in the right spot, right? So, um, so whether they're a Division One player or a Division Three player, they want to get the opportunity to get on the field. Nobody wants to sit around, right? And, and and for four years, so that perspective is so important because they they trust that perspective, and then we promote it. We promote it with that avenue, um, and and then they. Ultimately, I say they're going to get to the right place. Like we're, we're, we want to help foster that exposure to get you to the right place. So you don't have to rely on. And and I know everyone goes to college camps and all those kind of things. Hey, listen, here's another person. You could take the video that me and Mike do on you. And when you also go and do your part in reaching out to to coaches as you're in your own, you know, investing in your own recruiting process, you're welcome to take that video and use that as a part of your resume uh, in that process. And I think that's an important thing too, because, um, and 
and I've told kids this after they sent the video out, I posted it. If you have a question about something, DM me. I'm glad to answer a question for you. You know, uh, going to this camp for that versus that camp, going to this college camp for this college camp. I'll ask you the questions about your process and in in a very quick time period and get to get to the answer for you. So you kind of you're built you're building a relationship with uh, two people that are really understand that process, um, and it, it's 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 a good thing. It's a positive thing. And we want to be able to see you succeed. So, um, you know, yeah. it's my favorite thing, honestly, since I, you know, obviously I, I've been with rivals for 24 years and I'm writing articles on Mike I'm scout, I'm scouting and ranking 2023 players. And I'm going to do that in August and all this other stuff. And, you know, I'm following a transfer portal and I'm covering college football and I'm doing all the things that I've done for years. Uh, but I've never been able to do this. And, and it's not like, listen, I'm not a, I'm not a saint or anything, right? <laughs> I'm just a guy. But when I get one to come through from you, you know, it's exciting. You're like, we got another one. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. This is like cool. You know, this isn't like me, you know, asking a five-star kid, well, are you going to go to Georgia or Alabama? And him telling me, oh, I don't know. I have no leaders and all the garbage that you hear, which, you know, listen, I could, I could get through all that. Right. Uh, and it's part of the game. This is more, what do I have here? You know, so that when it comes through, I look at the huddle film and then I do some research on the kid and I look up, you know, statistics and any articles on him. Sometimes I'll reach out to the kid or his, or his parents and just say, you know, what did he play other sports? What's what? Tell me more about him. Um, and and then, then I'll give the evaluation. Then, I, listen, I'm not going to stay in touch with you. I'm not going to have dinner at the family. I'm not going to go to your Christmas, you know, parties and stuff like that. But it's <laughs> cool. It's just neat. So that's the most exciting part of this this independence that I have right now is when I get one of those a text message from you or something, um, you know, coming off a podcast and you're like, we we got another one. Take a look at this kid. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. And, uh, you know, we just got a 2024 uh, player from Georgia the other day and I'm going to delve into him today. Um, and I, I just it's something that I haven't been allowed to do since I started this, this uh, industry. So it, it, to me, it's kind of refreshing. So it's going to be like, we're not going to just take it. We're not going to look at a minute of it. We're not going to flip it out there and just not give a crap. Um, it's, it's just, it's more intriguing to me to scout kids like this than it is, you know, to compare, you know, somebody to Clowney or, or, or Terrell Pryor. Absolutely. And, and you get, you could listen, you can reach out to me, uh, at coach Schumann, you can reach out to Mike. Um, he's got now it's Farrell promote promos. What is it now? Yeah, Farrell, it's at Farrell promo. Okay. Um, and then there's M at M Farrell sports. Um, you know, at Farrell promo, what'll happen is, you know, if you follow that, someone will get in contact with you and just say, Hey, you know, are you interested in the opportunity here? And if you're not, you know, then it's just like, okay, great. Thanks for following. And we'll keep an eye on you. Uh, and if you are, then you'll, you'll be able to get in touch with all the right people. So at Feral Promo. And the reason I did that is because I wanted that to be specifically for this. I didn't want to have it all mixed in with my portal channel and my college football channel and my recruiting channel and all that other stuff. I wanted it to be specific. And it doesn't have a lot of followers. And it's not something I'm looking to get 100,000 at. Um, but... I wanted you to know that that's the home for this. If you're young and you want to get a head start, or if you're 2023, 2024, and you're under the radar and you need a little boost, that's what this is for. Yeah, and it's after our promo, right? Also on uh, Twitter, and then it's uh, at Mike Farrell Sports, too. Yeah, and yours is what? At Schumann? At Coach Schumann, and then you go at NUC Sports. Um, and then, you know, like I said, the, you see the banner there, that's the, the, the direct link. And then here's, you know, here's Mike's and, and, and mine, um, Twitter social, you could reach out there at, you know, at, if you have questions about it, we're glad, to, we're glad to help you out. Um, th this podcast has really, I mean, people are, as we cut up this podcast each week and, and, and give stuff out there, you know, you're always going to get nuggets from us on what college football, recruiting, NIL, 
but you're also going to get help with your own potential situation. Yeah, and the, you just got inside intel on Jadavian Clowney almost going to Alabama, Mitch Bustain almost going to Notre Dame, Terrell Pryor and his flirtation with Rick Rod at Michigan. You got Arch Manning intel. You're going to get nuggets like this because we've been around forever. And we have a story about most every good kid, you know, whether it's an experience that I had with him at an all-star game or at a camp or throughout his recruitment or, or, or whether it's, you know, David at his camps when he saw these kids when they were like ninth grade, 10th graders and as they mature. So the podcast is informational and then there's the sales part. It's M. Farrell Sports, though. It's not Mike Farrell oh, Sports. I'm sorry. I'll That's all right. That you know what? Mike Farrell Sports was too long. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Twitter has character limits. So I wanted Feral promotions. Um, and and I couldn't. So I had to do Feral promo. His Twitter won't let you have more than X amount of characters on your uh, handle. I don't know why. Let's see if I got it right. There it is. That's the one. I, I'll, I'll leave you on this fu this funny, interesting story. So remember the, the, uh, the almost bankrupt me first all-star game, uh, the old world game. We had... Uh, Johnny Manziel and Marcus Mariota on, on the same team. And I had known about Johnny Manziel a little bit from our camps. He had come to it. So, and, but Marcus had dominated the camps. Like it was in Hawaii, obviously it was a white camp, but he won like everything there was possible he could win. And uh, so they came and I was, you know, uh, the head coach of the team, that they were on was you you know Salisbury from White ha White Haven um, in Memphis right one yeah, of yeah. Uh, yeah yeah he's he was the head coach and um, I said oh how's Marcus Mariota doing he said Marcus Marcus looks great he's like but there's a there's a quarterback on this team that's doing just crazy things mm -hmm. just crazy and if you look at just to look at him like you know like a shorts and a t-shirt you're not gonna see it but you gotta see what this kid does in the game you know i'm sure he's gonna and it, and it was it was uh johnny mansell and it was so funny because you could walk right by like literally people don't realize that but you could walk by johnny mansell and uh, especially back then he was probably i don't know what he weighed maybe a buck 80 buck 85 you could walk by johnny mansell on the street you would never know that he was a kid who scored 70 touchdowns in high school between r rushing and passing in one season. And, um, but yeah, so then we went to the, to the game and all of a sudden Marcus Mariota had a little injury and he was out pretty quickly um, for the game. And Johnny Menzel basically played the whole entire time and was doing just, just bonker things. And uh, I mean, it, it, it was amazing, but that's a good example of two guys that were, they were probably what three were they was, so each of them was a three. Most of the schools wanted Johnny Manziel as an athlete slash wide receiver. Um, and Marcus Mariota was from Hawaii. So he did one camp on the mainland. And they, they were both committed to Oregon at the same time, um, which is I always find this stuff fascinating. Like, what if this, that, and the other? So when Mariota was brought in, Manziel decommitted because Texas A&M offered him and he wanted to stay closer to home. What if Mariota was never brought in? What if Texas A&M had never uh, offered him? What would Oregon football look like with Johnny football? And that's two Heisman winners two that Heisman. are three stars committed to the same school at the same time. So in like May and then June of that year, heading into their senior years, they were both Oregon quarterback commitments. And it's just weird to think about. What if they both stayed committed? And the portal wasn't around then. You had to sit out. Would we ever see Johnny Manziel or Mar Marcus Mariota like go on to be as successful if they were both at the same school? But I will tell you this, Oregon, they knew what they were doing back then under under Chip with the quarterbacks because they knew who to offer. Yeah, that is the amazing thing. And, and, and I think that even spells to the part of that we're talking about here, like, you know, Obviously, everybody loves the five star, and, and they're the ones that get the most talking talk about. The four stars get the next most talking about. But there's a ton of guys that are ranked just below those guys that will may, become the next Marcus Mariota or Johnny Manziel, and um, and they're they're fantastic players. I mean, obviously, they're Division One players, they're still fantastic players. 
but they just haven't gotten kind of maybe the notoriety for a variety of different reasons. And, you know, Johnny Manziel played in uh, Tivy High School, I think it was, right? Tivy, which was like. He's too a, small. Right. 2A he, or 3 two, three. Yeah. He was. You know, he wasn't big enough to be a quarterback. And this was right before the start of, you know, the success of the Russell Wilsons of the world in the NFL. And then everybody all of a sudden with, you know, Kyler Murray, who, who was on a higher scale, um, put up, you know, massive numbers and nobody questioned him whatsoever. Whereas Johnny Menzel years before was the same kind of dude, but nobody wanted him. And then Mariota was from Hawaii and nobody recruited Hawaii because that's a trip. That's a trip and a half. You can't go out there for three kids. So he came to the USC, I think the USC uh, Nike camp, but they were both three-star kids. And, you know, in hindsight, three-star rankings on Mariota, I was proud of. People were like, oh, you suck. He, he was number two pick. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. He's number two pick. Like, we saw him once, right? He had, like, one offer, and we had him as a three. So people just discount threes. They throw them away. They discount twos. You know, listen, I could I could list 15 NFL Hall of Famers off the top of my head that were two stars, period. So stars, listen, they're important to fans, and I've always said this to, to, to kids who complain about stars. I go, that's for the fans, man. It's not for you. Like Antonio Brown was a two star. He was a small little quarterback in Florida who had great problems. Kind of turned out to be pretty good. A little crazy, but pretty good. You know, that's not you. Stars are not you as a player. Stars are for that guy who's in his basement in the south or or or, or out west in his basement, in mom basement, and he's just a big, you know, fan and he's wearing like the freaking, you know, war paint and he cares about stars. Kids, who cares? Johnny Manziel and, and Marcus Mariota, three stars. They didn't, they didn't care. They both won Heisman's. That's exactly right. Well, on that note, you know, another great, great podcast this week. And, you know, we went an hour. We're verbose. Uh, yeah, talk, we're, we're definitely verbose. But... I talk so much. <laughs> I need a nap. Uh, that's what makes it fun. I need who else are you going to talk to? You know what I mean? You know, at least you talk to someone that has a similar interest. <laughs> I got so much useless garbage information in my head from the years. I'm too lazy to write a book, so I'll just throw it on a podcast here and there. There you go. There you go. Until right. well, till next week. Let's yes. live. You got it. You got it. Check us out, my, uh, footballcamps.com slash D1. Check out Mike Farrell on Twitter, M. Farrell Sports. Me at, at Coach Schumann. Check out Farrell Promotion at Farrell Promo. I think I got that right. And we'll see you next week. All right. Bye.